Hello, everyone. Welcome to our conversation with Helena Norberg Hodge, one of the people we've invited as, as wayfinders to speak with us about their journeys and learnings over the years in the context of bioregional regeneration. Um, and um, this is part of the summit on bioregional regeneration that's, that's being convened by the Regenerative Communities Network. Uh, and part of that, along with Melina Angel, Isabel Carlisle, the three of us are the, um, the core team that's pulling the summit together with support from many other people within RCN and beyond. Um, and you know, our focus here is on this idea of radical collaboration in service to regenerative uh, bioregional regeneration. How do we, we think we're at a moment when many different initiatives and groups at all different scales are ready to play with each other in a, in a more elevated and complex way, having achieved a level of their own kind of coherence and, and, and strength um, that we can start to dance at a, at a higher order, kind of like the slime mold that uh, Melina was telling us about in the plenaries yesterday. Um, and, uh, and that the times are calling for this, right? That there's an urgency to the times. And while we sometimes hear this story that, that there's not enough happening, you know, what I think is there's so much happening and I've heard you say this as well, Helena, it's below the radar though. It's like mycelium in the soil. So you could think it's not there, but it's actually everywhere. And, um, you know, the mushrooms suddenly sprout up and it's as if they came from nowhere. But of course there's, you know, Com so much that's been happening, including composting of things that have failed over years and years. So, so we're, we're, we're enriching that soil with this summit, hopefully. We're working with the network of networks that's already there to, to, uh, to take advantage of it, to move information and nourishment. Um, and uh, hopefully we're gonna get a lot of both of those in the next, um, in the next over the course of this hour. Um, so Helena, um, thank you for joining us. For those of you that don't know her work, and I only know a little bit of it, and she's the founder of, of Local Futures, which is an amazing global network that supports local scale transformation. She's one of the original powerful voices in the local food movement in particular, and, and you know, sort of tied how, how food systems connect to everything else. And, and, and it's just been a, an uncompromising voice, I would say, in, in this domain of, of, of understanding how we reimagine the human presence on the planet and, and return to who we really are. Um, so we're just so thrilled to have you here, Helena, to talk to us um, for this little bit of time. And uh, mostly we just want to listen to you. I, the format we have is just two, two simple questions. Um, First one maybe to take about five minutes and then maybe 15 for the next. And then we'll take questions from the group, um, probably in the chat and, and have, have you, we'll look at that set of them and have you respond to that. And then uh, I'll say a few closing words. Maybe we'll bring Melina in too. But if it feels like in the moment we wanna riff and play and somehow you know go a slightly different direction, we can do that. But if that sounds good to you, I'm gonna spotlight the two of us. I think that makes sense. and. Uh, and we'll go from there. Maybe my husband doesn't know me that. Yeah. So um, how are how are you doing tomorrow? <laughs> I'm really happy about the weather tomorrow. It's wonderful. We've had we had a big storm and it was very cold. Actually, now it's suddenly turned very hot. So I'm all still wet. I didn't think I'd be so sweaty going for a walk before this, but I ended up dripping um, anyway well somehow to me you always look fabulous so um thank you again and um, let's just dive right in um we didn't tell you this in advance i think we had said originally we were just going to ask you our calling question for the whole summit which i'll get to in a minute but um but i thought about one of my favorite processes is appreciative inquiry uh, and the appreciative interview process that's the core of that. And it always starts with a story of, a, of something specific that's that's a highlight of something that's that's worked well in, a, you know, that in the past. Um, and so in our context, we're wondering if you if there's something specific, some specific little nugget or just a short story about um, something that embodied this idea of radical collaboration in service to 
bioregional regeneration. What does that conjure up for you as some experience you had that was a real peak and highlight that you might share, as well as maybe a little bit of the essence of why it was so, um, so successful in, in, in whatever way it was? Well, I write off, I can think of a, an instant where I felt very happy about my attempt to link um, the realities of what's going on in the so-called global south, or let's say less industrialized, less urbanized parts of the world with what's going on within the center of the industrialized Western world. And so in building up this movement, this global movement, I've been bringing people and voices together. And one of those little aha nuggets was when Judy Wicks, I wonder if you know mm -hmm. who Judy is. Sure, She's ballet, in. right? Wasn't she involved in? She basically started ballet, yeah. The Business Alliance for Local Living Economies. And she started by, she had a cafe and then she became aware of needing to know where the food came from. And she started connecting with the growers and became very aware of the importance of that local scale in order to be more responsible and, and, and also more accountable because things become more visible. And at one of our conferences where we've been holding regional conferences around the world now for, um, well, since 2012, we've done about 28 international conferences. And at one of them, fairly early on in the process, we had also smaller sort of what you might now call wayfinder meetings with some of the thought leaders coming together. And Manish Jain was part of this. And if you know about Manish, he, he was Indian, but he, he was educated in America. He did really well. He's very bright, went to Harvard, and then worked with the UN and also with Goldman Sachs. And he became aware that this system is rotten and destructive. And as he says, he went to India to learn from his illiterate grandmother. Mm. And he ended up questioning mainstream schooling and the mainstream narrative. And what happened at this gathering was when we were having our, I think it was about a couple of days where we had more deep discussions having had public uh, a public conference before that and i hear judy saying oh i see what you mean and what had happened is that she then said i always thought of culture as theater and dance and what manish had managed to get her to see is the significance of cultural diversity and how in this part of the world that isn't so westernized, so industrialized, so homogenized, maintaining cultural respect and maintaining cultural diversity is so important. And I, I, you know, I was just actually even thinking about this today, how our work is rather unique in that we've been for 40 years with our feet and hands and eyes in both the less industrialized and the more industrialized part of the world and trying to bridge that, this particular moment when Judy got that much deeper understanding what we mean when we talk, when, when people from the non-Western non industrialized world talks about cult, talk about culture, they're actually talking about a whole way of life, they're talking about a worldview, they're talking about their language. And it, it relates also to the importance of distinguishing between what often in the West we call traditional. And in the West, when we talk about traditional agriculture, for instance, we're talking about chemical, fossil fuel-based, toxic <laughs> agriculture. In that other part of the world, we're talking about traditional. We're actually talking about the good guys and the good knowledge. Right. So there's a lot of there's a lot of translation and inter uh, deep dialogue that's needed. And that's something that we've been doing. And I guess another nugget I could tell you about was when the six foot tall, gorgeous, you know, handsome stockbroker from New York was learning how to milk a cow from a six year old boy in Ladakh. And the pride, you know, that this six year old boy felt 
in mm. teaching mm. IP, you know, they've been trained to think that America is better and that they're inferior and that hands-on skills are nothing. And here suddenly, and we had many nuggets like that in our programs where we sponsored reality tours both ways. We also sponsored people from places like Ladakh and Bhutan and so on to actually come to the West to see with their own eyes so that they could distinguish between the sort of changes they might actually want and the changes they might not want. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. earlier today we heard from Joe Brewer who was talking about that intermingling of the, the North and South. He's working in, in Barichara in Colombia and here he is a gringo kind of parachuting in, but really trying to not replicate the normal sort of white savior patterns and um so your stories evoke that i have a judy wick story too <laughs> we're here to hear you but it's a really short one and it actually relates to something that i was struck by in your um in, in the film planet local a quiet revolution um that that you produced and released earlier this year which i highly recommend to everyone i've put it up on the resources list that you can get to from the main space in kiko chat there's a a button for that and you're welcome to add to those resource lists too everyone um but at the end of that you talk about um how the localization movement can can bridge divides that when we're at that scale we're transcending a lot of these ideological divisions and the story that that judy told me was also about how we get past othering but it was about the um uh the standing rock protests against the oil pipeline and how the, the Native Americans and the whole collection, because that was also a very diverse group of people that came as allies, were not othering the, the police and the other you know, forces of aggression that were there to fight them. They were saying to them after, literally after they had been hosed down with, with water cannons in, in bitter cold weather, I mean, this horribly toxic attack on them, they come to them with, with food and with hand warmers and things saying, you're not our enemies, we understand you, know, you are our brothers too and sisters and um so that helen and judy was there telling me this 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 story because i i felt so entangled in you know how how do we avoid the blame and the othering because we need we are all in this together and you know especially the the folks who have authority over money and, and power have to be playing along and flowing resources down to the local level perhaps through the bioregional one. So anyway, I, I took inspiration from that, from Judy. And that leads us into the next question really is what, what opportunities do you see emerging now for radical collaboration in service to bioregional regeneration? Um, yeah, what's, what's well, showing up now? Yeah. For me, it is really the same as it always has been. And that is that already back in the seventies, because I was, in this rather unusual position of being in a culture that had not been affected by the dominant global economy. And I witnessed in this very dramatic way how in, in the name of progress, in the name of growth, poverty was created, pollution was created, unemployment was created, and very dramatically, a loss of self-esteem, a lot, dramatic decline in health and most most of all a dramatic decline in mental health mm -hmm. and that included um, young children being given the impression that their life was backward stupid they were nobody and so the deep loss of self-esteem in turn fueled competition ultimately anger and even violent conflict between groups of people who had been side by side for living side by side for hundreds of years. In the case of Ladakh, 500 years, there had never been group conflict between them. So I had this very dramatic black and white lesson in the holistic overall impact of the dominant economic trajectory. And I really believe that the opportunity today is for us to move away from blaming individuals, individual corporations, individual governments, but to understand that the dynamics that were set in place a very long time ago have inexorably been taking us towards the, 
from the outset, it was about driving people away from self-reliance and self-respect, driving people away from the land. And that happened through force, through slavery and closures. And later on, we thought around the time of the Second World War that these colonies that had started out sort of enslaved were being liberated, but we didn't understand these processes of economic centralization whereby with really good intention. I had some of these people in my family, um, a real belief that after the Second World War, we've got to avoid another world war. We've got to avoid another depression. So what we've got to do is integrate all economic activity. And so what they did in good faith, many of them, now maybe there were some Rockefellers there, maybe there were some very big wealthy families that benefited from it. In fact, there were, but the, the truth is there was a lot of good intention and there was a lot of ignorance at the grassroots of what this actually meant. And so the World Bank, the IMF, and this general agreement on tariffs and trade was set up. And the idea was we're gonna be integrating. And actually what that meant was rolling out the red carpet for Coca-Cola, Monsanto later on, to go in and out of governments freely. And the way to get that to happen was through this GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, where governments were being pressured to allow big corporations in and to also to develop the infrastructure that they needed. And I do think we need to recognize that part of that infrastructure was building up the global communication infrastructure so that the internet, the, the whole mobile phone, all of that structure has enabled and facilitated the expansion of these giant banks and corporations. Now, that doesn't mean that we should then say, well, we're not gonna use it. I think we need to use this infrastructure as we are now to try to generate more awareness. And, and I think we have an opportunity now like never before to create a movement that is bigger than anything we've ever seen. And it's because the dominant system has become so destructive that in virtually every country, the gap between rich and poor is widening in an obscene and obvious way, obscene, including in my native country of Sweden, in every country, the markers of mental health, the tragedy of teenage suicide are escalating and we are often not being informed about that. And I'm informing people now not to make you depressed and overwhelmed, but to say that we now have a common agenda like never before, and that part of the big picture is to be aware of all the signs at the grassroots that people don't want this and that people are doing something in order to deal with these crises. Because the other marker that we are also all becoming aware of is of course the environmental destruction. And I urge you all to listen to the voices that say, don't just focus on climate change, don't just focus on carbon. Carbon and the way that climate has been framed is a way for global corporations to make money out of this crisis while doing virtually nothing to lower the emissions that they generate through global trade. And so looking at global trade, understanding the mechanisms whereby we have this massive environmental deterioration, where we have this massive and obscene and growing gap between rich and poor. And looking at that bigger picture gives an opportunity like we've never had. You know, with women's rights, with ending slavery, we're still talking about a sector of the population. We are now talking about life on earth. We're talking about our survival and what I argue is that from our paradigmatic um, offering, we are offering a path that is deeply healing, spiritually, psychologically, individually, as well as socially, as well as the healing and restoration of life on earth. When you when you'd step back to look at that bigger picture and see the broader contours, then this shift from global to local in economic terms, economic terms, 
is what is essential and what brings with it enormous benefit. And it's particularly clear to look at this bigger picture and to see with, I would say, certainty that a shift towards local is essential, is um, particularly clear when you look at food and farming. And that's where we can see how the dominant trajectory, which drove people away from the land and introduced fossil fuel-based chemical agriculture has destroyed the soil, destroyed food, while destroying, of course, um, billions of farmers. And now we're at this stage where we really need to wake up because the corporate think tanks are coming up with an agenda which says we cannot afford agriculture, absolutely can't afford to have any animals whatsoever, and we can't even afford agriculture at all. And that analysis comes out of- Throw our food in vats, you mean? Yeah, shallow, superficial sources of information. In the meanwhile, there have been global studies that have shown that we must move in the other direction, but they've been squashed. So we're in this situation where I would argue it's not so much about ill will, but it's blindness. And the higher up the ladder of power you go, the more blind people are. And that's why I would also happily clothe and feed them, but I would want them to be able to sit and listen to another picture, another story. And I think what we're gathering now by trying to create alliances across the world is a unified story. We are part of nature. Nature is in us and healing us and healing the planet is one and the same story. And we are showing it. We have examples. And, and why I use the term local, but I was saying to Ben before, I'm happy to Certainly for me, it is bioregional. It's just that it's um, when it comes to talking about local languages, local knowledge systems, um, and even local economies, there's a lot that can be done in the city. There's a lot that can be done wherever people are, and somehow maybe local can work better. That's the, that's the language that for now that I'm choosing. But I'm also saying, please use holistic language. Don't um, don't use, for instance, just regenerative because regenerative is being supported by Monsanto and giant corporations because it is too narrow a term. It can fit into a, a, what what they're doing, which is extremely destructive, you know. And I don't think it's through ill will, but it's a logical consequence of being lost in a framing where the well, the complexities of life have become buried and hidden a long time ago. And the only way we get back to the complexities of life, the realities of life, is through more experiential, place-based knowledge, deep knowledge, whether it's knowledge about other people or knowledge about the, the plants, the earthworms, the soil, the water. We need that more localized, face-to-face -face knowledge to act in a way that's humble, in a way that is wise, and will always be reminded of our ignorance. The dominant system has allowed us collectively to become incredibly arrogant, and the whole system now is, you know, is exhibiting a type of hubris that's beyond belief. We have men prancing around on the world stage talking about, you know, darkening the earth protecting it from the sun in order to deal with climate change. We have, you know, Elon Musk and people wanting to go off to Mars to fight over minerals. And we have our intelligence agencies talking about fusing humans and technology. And we really have to have a strong and articulate rejection of this. And I think clarity. Hope that wasn't too, too long. No, I, I'm watching comments go by in the chat. I think it's it's all resonating um, quite beautifully. Um, one of the things that that was standing out for me when you talk about the importance of culture and that story of the, of the six year old boy teaching the the banker to milk a cow. Um, the part of the definition of a bioregion is that it's not just ecological; it is also the, the 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 people on that land and its history and its culture, cultures and, and languages, and that part of what defines or what people have used to define different bioregions is where that culture is shared. 
And um, so I think you're, you're naming the importance of that element too. It's not just the environmental, it's the synthesis of all of it. And, and um, you know, I think maybe we could move into some questions or, I mean, I could follow up on any number of things you said, but, um, uh, and it, it's interesting about what you're saying with the word regenerative as we've seen, yes, perhaps the roots of the word, you know, or how it's become popularized have some, some issues. We also just see over and over again that a term that's that's useful, like like woke, for example, gets gets co-opted and turned into the opposite of what it's intended to, and 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 so we lose the language. It gets taken away from us by by the business as usual forces in this very um, challenging way. So I, I you know, can I just go to what a number of people are saying about regenerative? I understand, uh, Killian, what you're saying and. Yeah, what what I'm what I'm saying is that when you really look at what's going on with food and farming, the distances between the farm and the table are now at most people don't realize that the US exports as much beef as it imports. Right. The well, here US, in New England, where I am, you know, major seafood production, right? 90% of the seafood that's caught here is exported. 90% of what we eat here is imported. It's it's madness. Exactly. And most people have no idea about that. And it does drive me a bit mad that, for instance, Greenpeace, I've spoken to the head of Greenpeace in the US, UK and Australia. They've not taken it up. And it's because this is so what we're talking about is that this corporate trade mania, which is central to this globalizing part by no, no discussion of it and only getting Al Gore on the stage telling us how we should drive our car less while industry is moving across the world every day, flying our daily bread back and forth, importing and exporting the same product, sending fish from Norway, from Australia to uh, China to be deboned, to be filleted and flown back again or shipped. Now, this is going on massively increasing emissions and we don't get to talk about it and it's not mentioned in the trade treaties there's no mention of the emissions from global trade because we have this blind leadership which goes back to the beginning of the economy so therefore when we're looking at food and farming in particular regenerative does not address this distance side of thing so i'm trying to urge people to combine the language of shortening distances, so more localized, more diversified, and genuinely regenerative. Those, if, if those three words were there, I think then we would be encouraging the direction that we must move in. Because the distances structurally from the outset have always encouraged monoculture, larger and larger monocultures, replacing more and more people with the chemicals so that people don't have to weed with the fossil fuels for the machinery and, you know, driving people off the land. Right now we're talking about the biggest social movement in the world is Via Campesina, and they are small farmers associations from around the world, particularly from the less industrialized part of the world. And they've been trying desperately to raise awareness among that large proportion of people who are now just consumers. And who How have no- How is working with that, that group? Yeah, well, we're collaborating with them and there are other groups. So now in England, we actually helped to start a group that's called the Land Workers Alliance that are collaborating with Via Campesina and are trying to say the same thing. So right now, um, yeah, so I do think, I do think is, um, it's important to articulate that local is part of what we're saying because it is not inherent in regenerative. And that's why uh, Unilever and Monsanto and Kellogg's are happy to use the word without any mention of local, without in any way, uh, trying to ensure that distances are shortened. The mention of local is a red flag for big business. Big business is trying to do everything they can to co-opt it. They're putting out studies that say, oh, no, no, if we keep flying our food across the world, keep shipping it across the world, it doesn't really add to emissions. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, 
unfortunately, these studies are done in a way that many people are persuaded by them. And so part of our need now is a sort of common sense, back to ground level, a deeper, yeah, <laughs> deeper common sense discussions. Well, it certainly sounds like common sense to me, and I'm thinking to most people here, perhaps, although I'm also seeing a little flutter in the chat. Um, let's yeah. let's ask for people to put questions into the chat and just kind of look at them as a as a collection, maybe, and then come back to you to to reflect um, in whatever way feels right, rather than just sort of taking one question at a time. We we won't have time for that, but um, but let's see what comes in if we just. Uh, Give people a moment to share some things and we can all yeah breathe. but can i also do a comment to killian because i think it is important because i i have a lot of friends who are very wedded to the word regenerative and they also get quite angry with me and i i just i just all i'm saying killian is please make sure there is a discussion about what regenerative means that's what i'm saying if you do then it's fine but I'm seeing too many people who have wonderful permaculture inspired small farms who were calling themselves permaculture biodynamic local and now are just calling themselves regenerative. And in a way, what they're doing is giving an alibi to Unilever and Kellogg's that are regularly using this language. So now, as long as we do spell out what we mean, fine. But I think that's very important. Yeah, I mean, I think. Famously, right? It's the practice of no-till agriculture, which has been sold to us as a way to avoid soil erosion and carbon emissions. And the way you do it at an industrial scale is by spraying Roundup so that you don't have to turn the soil over to kill the weeds. You kill it with Roundup and you plant Roundup ready GMO crops, right? So that's called regenerative. And Monsanto's making billions and, and Indian farmers are committing suicide as a result of this whole you know, global enterprise. So I think the point is is taken. Um, so let's see what other questions come in. Um, but I don't know, personally, I, well. I would like to ask something, Ben. Yeah, sure, uh, And it is about what, what I have observed. To the, into the stage here though, hold on. As our co-convener, co you get special privileges. So uh, <laughs> and if there's what anyone else observed, you see here, Helena, that you wanna bring it um, to, we could do that. Yeah, go ahead. What I have observed in Colombia, Helena, uh, is that many people that have been working really hard in local development and regeneration and trying to bring this forward, like uh, associations, and there are lots of people working on that. But at the point when either they are presenting a project to be funded or they are trying to gather momentum to be like a voice for government or things like that, they start to collapse into what the funding are asking from them, for example, that I have seen a lot, or, or you know, like the requirements of this kind of management system that doesn't allow the regeneration to be really regenerative in the territories. So this kind of a dissonance so hard between, between these two big words and the local real work. Um, so I, I just well, wondering how you see that. Well, I basically, I so agree with you. And that's where I, why I believe that this shift towards localization needs much more international dialogue and much more investment essentially in the in the paradigm uh, framing and thinking to create a strength both you know clarity of thinking and an ability to stick with this agenda and to try to start to to change some of the funders because as you know there's still a lot of goodwill there but people are so easily being co-opted because of a lack of clarity. And I think the clarity grows, again, as I was saying earlier, I think through a deeper north-south collaboration uh, so that, you know, the West does not, you know, maintain a narrow framing for, like I was saying earlier, culture, traditional, or even regenerative, you know, so that there is a, there's a lot of, there's a, a real strength also when we think about the 200 
million farmers in Via Campesina as composed as as opposed to the one percent, you know, still farming in America. And usually what we mean by farmer, you know, in most of the industrialized world is, you know, big machines and a man with headphones and which is why when I used to try to talk about farming and its importance, our people just environmentalists who just what farmers are the enemy is how how it was thought of, you know, and the and that's what's now materializing into a, a corporate agenda of literally now putting the last, you know, nails in the coffin of farming and by saying, showing only the fruits of their corporate agriculture, this industrial destructive farming, and of course the animal farming is the worst of all. No look at the healthy farming that's been going on for centuries, and even in America has carried on at a small local scale, you know. So so I would say clarity, 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 and more investment. I think we need to ask funders to put more investment into the actual think tank work. Uh, if I could just add that um, there was a, a fairly well-known book called Don't Think of an Elephant, written by a linguist named Lakoff. And what he did was to raise awareness among the Democrats that they had not invested so much in think tank work as the neoliberal, you know, right wing that wanted to drive this growth agenda. And sadly, from my point of view, I was uh, I was, you know, critical of what he was saying because for me he was missing the real paradigmatic difference, which is. The, essentially, we can put simplistically, you know, the life affirming, closer to the ground, thinking, the respect for life, that recognition that we are part of nature and everything that comes with that, as opposed to the mechanistic the top down view, which the left and right were both guilty of. So left has also embarked, you know, on a, on a, a growth agenda, which has never deeply understood these truths which are, you know, spiritual as well as very practical. So anyway, what I'm seeing is that in the movements where people are waking up to the deeper spiritual, ecological, you know, if you like indigenous, bioregional side of things, there's even less attention to the think tank work because there's a tendency to believe we just got to get on with the action. It's so urgent, let's get on with the action, action, action. And we do need action, but I would argue today that the most important action is raising awareness to build up exactly what you're saying, what you're seeing in Colombia, the weakness of those groups in terms of funding, in terms of voice. You know, we have, we don't have a platform where we can be heard. And what's happened is that, you know, at a at a very insidious level, the mainstream now will advertise a type of Green New Deal with plastering earth with solar panels and mingle that in with a message about indigenous. And I mean, they're just, you know, really frightening things going on that way, really confusing people and merging the deep longing that people have to reconnect with the earth but shaping it in a way that we need to be very alert to and we need to be doing much more of the think tank work and the dissemination. And I call that big picture activism. You know, it's the activism of sharing that big picture, sharing it from a global point of view. And, and I believe that if we can, which at one point I did manage to get some very... Uh, wealthy people to support this trajectory, but if we can um, get help for the, the the rethinking through global dialogue, and I'm not talking about, we don't need a lot of time. I'm not talking about some long process of research or anything. I'm just talking about really trying to get that deeper discussion so that Westerners really listen to more of what's going on in the global South. And I'm I'm talking also about part of that is women having a stronger voice. Most of the voices tend to be male, and most of the deep wisdom tends to be female. So, of so many exceptions, but it's these these are part of the patterns, you know. Where, but we as I'm saying, it's not like we need a lot of time for that rethinking. But what we do need is money 
and help to get those pictures up, whether through film, but also platforms that will reach people. Um, so. so there's an opportunity for radical collaboration that yeah. you have there. And I think um, because there are many groups that are you know, talking about that, often it comes in, in the frame of a new narrative, for example, or a new economics. Um, and you know, can we work collaboratively to, to lift up those ideas, whether it's a, a traditional think tank or maybe there's some you know, new paradigm version of what a think tank does that doesn't exist in some giant building. But um, I can I share a few of the questions that have come in in the chat quickly and we'll maybe yes. spend a bit of time with that before we close. Um, so let's see, we have, um, just a, this is more an observation from someone that, that calling out um, calling out greenwashing is a great way to build connection and have a conversation that builds trust. Um, that uh, how, here's another one. How do we deal with access to land for younger generations? It's easy for property generations to envision participating in localization. Um, but uh, localization is much more limited for millennial renters. Um, and uh, we're seeing here in New England, the disappearance of most of those family farms because there isn't another generation to take them over. And it's much more lucrative for the families to sell to developers. And you have these sort of gentleman farmers that are not really working the land well. Um, here's another one, I think, uh, let's see, maybe, well, maybe that's enough. Um, there well, are a lot. Love Here's yeah. one more. Um, okay. Do we know? Do we know what truly regenerative, sustainable is? Do we? Do we know how to do it? Um, I guess that was, that was Killian. Yeah. And here's one more. Um, simplicity and degrowth. What is your position or your thought about about those those frames? And one more too before we go back to you. How do we raise awareness? when people are subject to cognitive dissonance and they don't believe ideas against that, that, that go against their current beliefs if you're presenting them with something that, that challenges that. Okay. Okay, well, maybe take that last one first. My sense is from um, engaging with people that people are really ready for this message. Okay. That I, I often use the example of that film Avatar which had this huge you know, reach throughout the Western world. And it was essentially indigenous good, corporate bad. And of course, not, help, not helping us to understand how the corporations have so much power, why we have this gap between rich and poor. And that's what's missing, you know. And, and also we have to be very wary of a very simplistic idea about indigenous, because really now, it's not just indigenous elders and, and very often indigenous elders can't help us that much because they often haven't had enough of an experience of the Western dominant system, which is why the, the dialogue between, you know, from within the West and, and more on the periphery, if you like, is so important. But um, so I, I actually think that when you present people with a more holistic common sense paradigm vision people are ready for it and so what i'm seeing is that we you know we've been shadow banned by facebook we 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 can see the way that local is being co-opted we have had many friends on the left like naomi klein like um george monbiot people who have been like this about local anti i mean i've had monbiot a, you know, thinks we should grow food in vats so there's a very, uh, you know, disturbing way that that we do need to spell out that bigger picture. And I do think the majority of people are ready, but it's a question of how do we get it out there and reach more people. And then I think in terms to, to what do I think? So there, simplicity or degrowth, I think they're not words that are so attractive to people. I'm um, what the main founder of the degrowth movement is a close friend, Serge Latouche, and he had a lot of time in, in Africa and so therefore also had more of that global perspective. So we totally agree about what we're trying to promote, but he sticks or did stick to decroissance or degrowth. And I feel that for most people, 
that's not an attractive concept because people are so confused about the right. economy needing to grow for them so they, they can afford to pay their rent or their mortgage. Whereas the, the image of how can we strengthen the local economy and create an economy that is circular. And by the way, that takes me on to the question about how can we have young farmers join the market? How can we get land for them? What's happening in the localization movement is that people in their local community are coming together, realizing how important food security is. And they are often investing in a local farm and helping in many cases, they would even pay the farmer for a whole year in advance. Right. And they will often even pay extra so that people in the community who can't afford to support it as much as they can, can afford to buy the food at a lower price. So that's what happens when we start building community spirit. And I wanted to mention an example of this in Vermont where um, and it's a related example where uh, Bale, I hope you've heard of Bale, is a small but very good. We met in person, or at least I was in the same room as you. I don't know that we actually met, but the, they put on that wonderful uh, Localize It conference a few years back. For example, recently, where they felt for their local group to continue with this process, they needed to have a space where they could meet. And they, uh, a lot of shops are closing down and everything, but it was still very expensive to find a central space in the town. But they managed to persuade uh, an owner to lower the rent enough so that this local group could afford to use that space. And then it makes me cry almost, but you know, like three months later, when he saw what they were doing, he lowered it much more because mm -hmm. he was so happy to see. the. And so there are these circles of support that can grow. And what we're also seeing, I don't know why I'm feeling so teary now, but you know, there is so much stress in the world and, the, and um, it's just so sad that these things are not getting out more widely. But another example here is that in these farmers markets I helped to start, the farmers the other day were telling me, do you remember 20 years ago when we started what our vehicles were like, they were broken down, you know, we were barely managing. And these are older generation farmers whose children are now following in their footsteps because it's lucrative enough and they actually enjoy being in the farmer's market. They enjoy having connection with people who love what they're producing. And so I, I can't sing highly enough the praises for the local food movement and how important it is to start with that, to study it, to really understand the potential in, in localization. And that's where I would stick to local as the central term, and yet it's not enough. I would say just like with regenerative, it's being co-opted, you know, HSBC markets itself as the world's local bank you know they can they can say anything they want to because they have the money to push it up you know there is something and that pop up not evil people that's the thing i you know but they they're there struggling you know as a ceo if you start saying oh well i'm not so concerned with profit you know you're you're out and so we have to look at the structures we have to demand that corporations are regulated. And the, and the way to do that is not to create a global government, but is to insist that every business has to belong to a Democrat, to, to a nation state. So from now on, we would be talking about, you know, over the next years, there would be a transition period, but you have to decide, are you General Motors American or are you Japanese or are you German? Because Volvo and Mitsubishi and all of these have long time ago said goodbye to the governments, but the governments are naively supporting them and believe that supporting their multinationals is supporting their own country when countries are actually getting poorer. So there's a there's a truth there that just needs to get out. And I just think most people would agree with it. Thank you so much for all of these reflections. And, and um, I think you know, just like there's no 
single word or, or easy, you know, there are no easy answers. Part of, of holistic work at, at the landscape and the bioregional scale is the complexity of the whole systems, right? So in some sense, it's very simple. And I think what I what I love about listening to you and 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 what I see of the work is that you have this clarity and, and in many ways it, it can seem simple. And yet when we start unpacking any dimension of it, we see, well, there's this and there's that and it all knits together. And, and we don't even necessarily, my sense, is, I don't know, maybe this is something to close with. And because I'm, I'm you, you said you were getting teary and, and to me looming behind all of these conversations is this question, is, is the possibility of, of collapse and the, the fact that we're undergoing that in, in many ways. And of course you could argue, well, that needs to happen, that business as usual needs to collapse in order for something new to, to emerge. And, and you know, maybe we wanna hospice it rather than strangle it. Um, but, but where am I going with this? That, um, I guess I'm the possibility. How? Where is? Well, maybe you can just speak to, to, to whatever is, is coming up for you now. But I, but I think maybe this is this is it that that I've seen a danger in in groups and movements clinging to the idea that we we will and we must make it to you know this this desired future, and that the only work that is pure enough and valid enough is something that's taking us all the way there. And then if you're compromising in any way with your language or you're too entangled in the business as usual framework, you're, you're just, you know, you're part of the problem, not the solution. And, and so I think that, you know, part of what the benefit is of saying, well, we might not make it means that the work, it frees us up in a way to do what our hearts call us to and, and to serve. That's part of the beauty of the local level, I think too, right? Is that it's about resilience and, and, and surviving whatever comes in some ways. So those are just, I, I don't know, I'll leave you to, to riff off that however you want. Well, I, guess, I guess one of the things I would love to riff on that is I think people often confuse the collapse of ecosystems, the collapse of societies, and in a way the collapse of people, with the collapse of the system. And I think we, we really need to distinguish that because the truth is that unless there is a bigger wake up, this system as it's now being supported, even by us, if we don't articulate our opposition to this systemic path, then it, we made a short film actually quite a long time ago that we called Before the Last Tree Falls. And we were saying, please wake up to the way that this system has been set in motion and even you in many ways are supporting it. And please, you know, don't, don't play the blame game and think, oh, it's just the people at the top because actually your values, your assumptions about how you educate your child, going along with what governments for years now have been saying, oh, we've got to change education to be more competitive in the global economy. What that's meant is our children have to be trained up to suit the needs of global corporation, not the needs of healthy farming, healthy clothes, housing, our needs. And not, you know, so this speedy, stupid rat race where even CEOs are scared because if they slow down, then, then the merger will mean that the other guy is on top. So we've, what's being created with our help is a system that is so destructive. So I, I won't go on too much about that, but it is a bit frustrating to me that very often people just don't want to think about it. They think it's too big. And I think that's, that's the problem, is that people don't realize how clear and simple it would be to demand how to stop that rat race doesn't mean without numbers that it would happen, but with numbers, it would, because it's so stupid, it's so crazy, it's so arrogant and so destructive. But on the other side, as you were saying, in my world, you know, I realized earlier on that whatever we do, whether that system continues in its mad, very destructive way or not, we're going to need to rebuild the local. We must rebuild our connections to others and to nature to function in a sane, in a in a soulful way. Someone was saying, you know, the local is about regaining the soul of deep interdependence, of the oneness of life that every spiritual tradition has at its heart, that message. 
And as we reconnect with that fabric and feel part of this amazing dance of life, and as we learn to, on a daily basis, appreciate and really treasure that wealth of life, and it, and it takes its form even when we cook together, when we dance and sing together in a local participatory way, not in a show-off culture where there are a few stars, fewer and fewer stars paid more and more money while everybody else is more of a passive spectator. And while people literally in the West, people have been silenced. I too, I didn't think, oh, I don't dare to sing. I'll just mouth because I'll spoil it for other people because you have to be perfect. You have to be a star. So the whole Western world has been silenced. And in the non-Western world, people still sing together. That's an amazing spiritual wealth that again, we need to wake up to. So I think that building the local right now as part of becoming more whole and stronger and happier while not forgetting about articulating and disseminating both the no to further corporate rule and globalization and the yes to life and community. Um, you know, we can do that from a growing strength and a growing sense of we instead of I, turning the I into a we. Well, thank you so much, Helena, for thank you. the time to join us. And, and uh, we, we were blessed by your presence yesterday too in, in the opening plenary, um, but a recording, which is also up on, um, on the recordings list for the summit. So you can see that message separately as well as in the whole plenary. And, and um, uh, you were followed by Edward Muller, who, who Melina works with in Costa Rica. And he was naming some of the, the very same patterns that, that, that you were as well in terms of the, the challenges of the dominant globalized corporatized system and how we need to wake up and what we need to unlearn. So there's a lot of resonance to what you're saying, I think, certainly in this field. but. I think what I'm taking away too is that it's, this is everywhere, you know, like mycelium in the soil, in the air, the old story, the, the, the neoliberal story, we haven't used that word, but it's been, it, it's been implied, is hollow even to the neoliberals, right? Even Alan Greenspan who basically said after 2008, oh, I guess I was wrong about the markets being so wise. Um, it that doesn't resonate good. for anyone. It's why we have Trump too, because, you know, clearly this story, the promises of modernity, as, as Vanessa Andriotti would say, are, are not you know, are, are not things people believe in anymore. And so what you're no, preaching is something people yeah. can believe in. So thank you. Yeah, well, you say preach, well, you know, I don't want to sound too much like a guru, but I also want to tell people about our World Localization Day, which is a way of highlighting all these amazing initiatives around the world. I hope you'll join, I hope you might you know, actually sign up and do something, you know, often people will just organize a local food feast and then hook up with people, you know, around the world to demonstrate their commitment. Other people are building networks and we're having this big summit, like a world localization summit in Bristol next September, at the end of September. So um, about a year from now, and I hope some of you will join us there and I really hope Melina and um, that we'll be now collaborating together um, and talking soon about how we can collaborate also for, for Bristol and WLD. So I hope to hear from you soon. The localfutures.org, yeah, uh, right, is where people can find information about. Yes, um, local futures. Yeah. 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 But is the summit information for next year? That's, that may not be up there yet. Not so yet. For, for not localization yet. day though, they can find there. Yeah. I can say now that people might know Charles Eisenstein, uh, Satish Kumar, Bio Akomalafe, Manish Jain, um, Michael Schumann. Those are some of the people who will be there and speaking. Wonderful. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you very much, Helena. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you. And thanks, Ben. Let's Let's bring everyone on mic for a second. I'm going to change. I'm going to unspotlight and go to. Um, uh, awesome. Or no, maybe. Uh,
So let's just give, give Helena our thanks here. Thank you, Helena. Thank you, Helena. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Helena. Thank, Thank you, you Helena. Much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye.